All right, 442. This this one's a tough one for me. Uh, I, th- I think I mentioned this on Monday. I was talking about it a bit. I forget at what time frame, though. Pat was sus with cocaine. He was sus, but he was innocent, was the resolution to that. So the intent is that he's an art dealer. No, you're selling art and then trading it. That's why that million dollars was never spent, because he's going to use that to invest in more art. And he specializes in art from Colombia. So Pat was Pat's innocent. That's the whole point of that, is that it looks crazy suspicious. But he was innocent. Uh, he was, you know, as a separate incident, like, he also was addicted to cocaine. But he was not a cocaine dealer. But he would have gotten flagged as such by uh, by many different people. Cocaine is an art. <laughs> art smuggler, not dealer. And correlation is not equal causation. That is a... Yeah, I, I've said that a few times during this uh, this semester too, but worth repeating forever. This is such a huge misconception. Correlation is not equal causation. Just because he has a million dollar deposit from Colombia and is a cocaine addict yeah though there's some correlation there but it doesn't mean it's cause there's no causation we can't say well he got a million dollar deposit from columbia because he's a a cocaine addict and therefore a cocaine dealer can't say that we can't make that argument even if the evidence is just screaming out hey this is suspicious we can't jump to conclusions it's one of the big ideas there He, I, so this, who said he's addicted to cocaine? This is where, you know what, let me put Chad on screen for this whole lecture too, by the way. Since we're just having discussions. Um, so he... So I kept missing this. I, I kept going back and forth on this one when I was... At an, at an, at a discussion that's starting off well if I can't even talk. Um the discussion but he was arrested for a cocaine overdose it's it's kind of hard to talk your way around that one he you know that's uh that's pretty damning that he is a you know at least did cocaine one time but he was in and out of the the rehab center i was saying well maybe he was paying for somebody else's rehab but the police report with a cocaine overdose it's pretty Are we learning today or is it 116 office hours? No, it's 442. So this is... Can we get to 442 and talk about drugs? Well, let's do that then. So, here's a bonus for him being the best customer. Uh, So, this this lecture is kind of a heartbreaker for me. We'll see how it goes. Um... But we're going to discuss a variety of ethical issues as they relate to computer science. Now, it's a heartbreaker because these this is my favorite lecture of the whole year. I absolutely love this lecture. When we're live. When we're live, I can say, hey, let's talk about this. And we have a class-wide discussion, and it's great. Uh, it's a heartbreaker because I don't know how this is going to translate to Twitch chat. I think this is going to be a lot more difficult for me to run just because the it takes a different skill set and I'm not quite sure if this is in my wheelhouse. But we're about to find out, so let's do it. So we're going to talk about a variety of different ethical situations and we'll see how it goes. And the reason it's not really in my wheelhouse, or maybe it is, I don't know, we'll find out. But in lecture, I'll just throw out a prompt and then let the class discuss, and only if the class is getting way off track, then I'll make a, a course correction and get us back on track to talking about ethics. Uh, so I can't really do that since I have to be talking the whole time and filling up the you know the silence in the stream. It's going to be a li- bit tougher. But I am going to assume, I'm going to stay on live chat, and I'm going to assume that all of you are reading the chat. So where normally I'll read and respond to each each message, not going to do that today because hopefully y'all are talkative and I don't want to be behind. I'm always going to stay on live chat so I can see the current discussion, even if I have to just skim the questions and not read them all and not respond to everything. So anyway, with that, oh, damn it, that's right. 
I'm going to have to put chat back on screen every time I click. So here's our first discussion to have. This is uh, a current event happening right now. Zoom unethical. We can talk about other things, too. We can go off the slides, too. I like these being super open-ended. I would give a prompt, and as long as the class is talking about ethics, I'm happy. Um, so even if we don't go through the slides, I'd be happy with that. I'd be fine with that. But you have access to the slides if you want to see where we're going in the prompts. So this is current event. The EU is actually suing, uh, is suing Amazon for this practice. So let's talk about the ethics. There's obviously a legal aspect to this. Since it's in the courts, the courts are going to decide the legal aspect. But I want to talk about the ethical aspect of this. So Amazon, you may have heard of them. They're an online retailer. They sell their own goods online. But they also host third-party sellers on the platform and allow third-party sellers to use their platform to be able to get business and you know sell things to their customers. So far, nothing too too crazy, but they do have this dual role where they're allowing third-party sellers on their platform, but they are also one of the sellers on their own platform. So they're competing against the third-party sellers, which is the, the dual role that we want to focus on. So, and where it's getting into the courts and where we want to discuss is that Amazon is using the data from their third-party sellers to inform their own decisions about their retail business. So if they see, for example, if they see that a third-party item is selling very well, they can, they'll introduce their own version of that product and put it on the platform and compete with the third-party sellers by taking advantage of the fact that they can see what the third-party seller was doing, how you know the, the rates of sales and everything, all the information about that, and then compete with those third-party sellers, having that advantage of knowing all of their information. So, of course, we can talk about it in the context of Amazon. Uh, what if AWS, what if they're doing this with AWS? What if Google and Apple are doing this with mobile apps? There are a lot of other places. This isn't an Amazon-specific because it's not super relatable unless you're selling things on Amazon. But what happens when you have your app out there on AWS and they're monitoring your traffic and your users and then saying, whoa, you're getting a lot of traffic over there with this app and we have access to your code, uh, we're going to make a competing, a competing product. Can I make this bigger? Enter <laughs> font size. Uh, 24. That's too big. Hey, that's better. Amazon sucks. Without your personal opinions, like, uh, about Amazon and stuff. Amazon sucks, so I hope bad things will happen to them. It doesn't really answer the ethical question. What if, why does Amazon suck might be more interesting. Why do you have that opinion? And, uh, and what if a company that you don't think sucks has this similar dual role in this dual practice where they're taking their customers' data and using that to compete with their own customers, you know, to sell better to other customers. As long as it's disclosed, you're fine with it. It's fair enough. Hey, you chose to use our platform. You know what we're about. You know that's on you. Um, it's possible, and we can with that conversation we can talk about is Amazon like do they have to use Amazon? Is Amazon getting to the point where it's a monopoly, where if you want to be in on you know selling your product online, it's either Amazon or have way fewer sales, or is that even true? I don't even know. Oh, and with these ethics discussions, I keep I try my best to keep my personal opinions out of it. But I will say prompts. Sometimes I'll play devil's advocate. You know, I'll, I'll throw things out there just to uh, just 
just to try to prompt more discussion. So, and one thing I see a lot of students usually do, and I'm already seeing it here, is just give a one-liner out there and say, case closed. Uh, whenever you do that, I'm going to challenge you more. I'm going to challenge your position and say, well, what about this? What about this? So just to give you some meta information about what I'm going to do. It's not really insider knowledge. So it's insider knowledge if they're, like, I can't, I don't have that knowledge of how much each product is selling on Amazon. Amazon has that knowledge because it's going on on their servers. They have, they can, you know, see how much, uh, how much traffic they're getting. They can look at the, the trends, who's buying from this third party seller and this third party seller. Something either of those sellers wouldn't have, wouldn't be able to do that cross-referencing data. Uh, Amazon is in a privileged position in terms of the data that they have about the sales. Their party sellers know, so it's not unethical. I, I mean, just because somebody knows about it, does that mean it's not unethical? Like, if I say, if you a good example like i know that I, i'm actually in a lucky spot but i actually i know that i only have two choices for isps i know that i knew that when i bought my house i still think that's unethical that they push out competitors uh, just because i know about it doesn't mean it's perfectly okay UB knows that if they increase tuition, you're going to pay. They can tell you. You can know about it. Hey, just so you know, I'm increasing tuition. I don't think that makes it ethical. Maybe that is still ethical. There's a lot to unpack there. But uh, maybe they need the money to be able to deliver a quality educational experience. I don't know. I'm not saying that's my position. But, uh, but again, I'm going to try to keep my positions out out of the conversation. It's Amazon or nothing. Yeah, I, I'm... I just said I'll keep my positions out of it. I'll, I'll keep my position out, but I'll say my behavior as a customer. I'm very hesitant to go to a third-party site. If a third-party seller is selling on Amazon, especially if they're selling it with Prime, with two-day shipping... I'm much more likely to purchase that than I am to go off-site, off of Amazon and buy the same thing, even if it's the same price, even if they still offer two-day shipping. Like, I, I know I'm not going to have to... If it's on Amazon, I don't have to type in my credit card. That alone is pretty valuable. <laughs> I murdered you, but you knew it was happening, therefore ethical. Yeah, really, if I said, I am going to hunt you down and murder you, you know about it, <laughs> so <laughs> therefore it's fine. Uh, that's like, a, and if, oh, here's another example. If a company put in their terms and services some really crazy, like, we now, uh, we own your, oh, what's a, we, we get all of your money now. Like, if you have a job, every paycheck goes to us now, and you click agree because you didn't read it. And they have the argument, well, well, you knew about it when you clicked it. <laughs> like, uh, I don't think that argument's going to fly too well. You knew about it. Spectrum is super unethical. I to, I'll keep most of my opinions out, but that one I'll have to agree with. ISPs, I already gave my put my opinion out there. They, they participate in so much anti-competitive behavior. I can't believe they get away with that shit. I just want Google Fiber. When... Google Fiber tries to go into new cities and it's nothing but lawsuits from the existing ISPs and tier ones. That's not okay. Like, that's not cool. So we're, in general, we're okay w with this. Uh, how about the AWS situation? So they're doing it with third-party sellers. Maybe you can't relate to that. What if you deploy your app on AWS... They start analyzing your traffic, watching the customers that, that use your site. And as soon as your site starts getting some decent traffic, Amazon puts up a competing service and says, well, hey, they're getting some good 
numbers and their number of viewers or number of visitors, well, we can do that too. Or Amazon, and they just poop Amazon division to compete with your app. Brick and mortar stores get information from other brick and mortar stores as well as their own stars from third party vendors. Um, I, I would argue that's a little unethical, depending on how they're getting the data. If they're going to the vendor and saying, hey, vendor, how much did you sell to my competitor? I'd say that's unethical on the vendor and the company asking for that data. And here I'm violating my own thing. Let me keep my, my opinions out of it. So is that, let me word it as a question. Is that okay for uh, for a brick and mortar store to get information about their competitor from a common vendor? Doesn't that, I'm trying to understand pockets, what you're saying here. Doesn't that help the competition? If Amazon is, is like limiting the third party on AWS, then it is an issue. I don't see how any of this could help the competition. But if Amazon is limiting third party on AWS, then it's an issue. So it helps the competition when it's retail, but it hurts when it's AWS. I'm, I'm failing to see the comparison. A lot of people don't realize but a lot of displays in stores aren't owned by the store himself, but the company that makes the product. Oh, yeah, fair. <laughs> yeah, so what if they don't offer to buy out the creator? I mean, if you're hosting on AWS, they can already see everything that you're doing. They can recreate that app. And so what if they're, that's the point. What if they're competing against you and not buying your app? If they just buy your app, you know, whatever you, just, you agree on a price and you sell it. But if they're launching a competing service based on the information that they have strictly because you're hosting on AWS, that's where, that's the question I want to go. That's the question I want to analyze. More or less insider trading, which makes it unethical. then become part of Amazon. So that's the point. What if Amazon's not doing that? Like they could just buy up these third party resellers and no one would no one would complain about that. Uh, unless it was an aggressive takeover, a forced takeover, but it is morally reprehensible to work for a company whose ethics directly contradict your own wait question mark? I thought that was a statement, not a question. Uh which is so that's a big part of why we want to talk about ethics is a lot of you oops actually we can we can go to the next one anyway and i can bring back chat uh so that's a lot of what we want to talk about with this is oh come on as i put terrorists up there with no context for a while is if you're working for a company a lot of you are going to work for companies that you may or may not disagree with um may or may not well all of you will work at companies that you may or may not with but a lot of you will work for companies that you're going to disagree with at least some aspect of what they do on an ethical level you're going to say we really shouldn't be doing that uh, there there will be at least one thing i mean i can think of at least one thing that ub does that i am not cool with so should you continue working for that employer how you know is there a limit like if they're doing something this egregious i'll quit but this egregious i won't but um, but if it's not enough, then, you know, I'll be cool with it. Um, do you, what do you speak up about things, uh, things like that? Like what you will be in these positions where you have some ethical dilemma, where your company will be doing something you don't like. You're going to be the whistleblower or are you going to be the person who says, well, I need a job, so screw it. Uh, which I've had students during these discussions just blatantly say, I don't care about nothing. I just need money. I'm going to do any job ever. If they have me writing software to kill people, I don't care. I've actually had students say that in lectures. Some of you may feel that way. 
I, I would compel you to reconsider your life, but you know, especially in software engineering, there are so many jobs out there. You don't have to work for that crap company if you don't agree with their stuff. Uh, so I'd compel you to rethink that position if that's how you feel. Maybe you think it over, you rethink it, and you're still okay with it. You know, you're going to do what you're going to do, but at least put some thought into it. Yeah, good one. So with Oreos, if we're talking about Oreos, is that unethical? A store sees that Oreos are flying off the shelf, so they make their own generic brand Oreos, which is basically the same thing we're talking about. Amazon has the Amazon basic product lines, and they're like, it's basically the, the store brand. So is it okay when brick and mortar stores do the same exact thing? Because that happens a lot. Any store has their store brand. Should the EU be suing them as well? I need a moment to live. I'm not going to jail for anyone. So we're talking about ethics. So with ethics, at least my definition of ethics is if you're going to jail for it and it's illegal, it's probably not an ethical dilemma. It's probably just everyone agrees that it's bad. So there's real no ethical discussion to have. There are also on the other side of the spectrum, there are things that everybody agrees are good. That's not really an ethical dilemma. But if we're disagreeing on it, especially if there's roughly a 50-50 split in the class about whether it's good or bad, uh, so to say, you know, to overgeneralize, then we're talking about ethics. When we disagree, what's that gray area where we don't really know, um, where we there is no clear answer if we should or shouldn't? You want to go home and rethink your life. Yep. You can quote me on that all day. <laughs> if in that context, if you give the context, please. Or fine, that just applies to everybody. You should always rethink your life. I rethink my life, you know, every once in a while, too. Just to make sure I'm on the right track. 500k salary. Yeah, some people say it. 500k salary, you put enough money in front of my face and in my bank account, I'll do whatever you want. I would compel you to think about it. Some of you will still decide, I don't care, but. Oh, that, yeah, that's a good take on it, Tensai. So because the store brands and the brick and mortars don't have as much clout as the Amazon brand name, since the Amazon brand is so strong, more so than like the Walmart brand or the Target brand. Um, I forget what Target calls their... Target can't call their brand Target, but uh, but they have some name for it. Or the Wegmans brand. Since Amazon is a stronger brand, you're going to say that it's not okay. But if Amazon was a weaker brand, then it would be okay. It's an interesting take. That once they start winning... And, and you see this a lot. Like People can be okay with something until they start winning. When somebody starts winning and you're not okay with it, well, now it's a problem. You, you do see that a ton. I don't want to sell you dust sticks. I forgot what I forgot the reference from that. And there's the other side. So, like the with the store brands, the brick and mortar store brands. You know, everyone knows Oreos sell well. And with Amazon, I don't know their full product line, but a lot of it's like cables, Amazon brand cables I've bought before. And things that just everybody needs. Everybody knows they sell well. I don't know how much they had to rely on the data. So I haven't looked through the specifics of the court case. Um, but it'd be interesting to see what actual products they're talking about. Because if it's just all the super generic stuff, would that make a difference other than if it's some very super specific product and then they're putting up their own brand for that? Yeah, in... And beefy Indian kid, it's not the point of this 
ethics discussion isn't to say you need to be ethical. The point is to make sure that you're thinking about it. So do you have a responsibility to take what you've learned at UB and go out there and do good in the world? Objective good and follow a, a strong moral code and ethics? I'd say no. I, I, I'd say that's that's up to you. You you paid for an education. You can go out there and do whatever you want with it. I'm not going to tell you what you can and can't do or what you should and shouldn't do. But I will compel you to think about it at least. If you're going out there and just acting completely irresponsibly and just not thinking about the consequences of your actions, then we haven't done our jobs as educators. We haven't properly prepared you for the real world if you're not even thinking about those decisions. If you think about those decisions and you say, I'm okay with it, you know, that's fine. Uh, there, There's a big moral gray area in ethics. I'll, I'll put a, um, a concrete example on this for working for a defense contractor. I'm not going to tell anybody that they shouldn't go work for a defense contractor. There's some great opportunities out there and some defense contractors do great things without, you know, profit, you know, war profiteering. I guess, you know, I guess by definition they are, aren't they? So I'm not going to say you should or shouldn't work for one of those companies. But you should at least think about it. If you have a strong moral objection to what they do, you know, at least give it some thought. Don't just go to the first company who gave you a job offer. You know, give it some thought and think, is this what I want my legacy to be? You know, do you do you want to be the pre Iron Man one Tony Hawk or Tony Stark or the post Iron Man one Tony Stark? To put it oversimplify. All right, so let's talk about the the next thing we we spent half the time. So this is working pretty well, I, I think, doing this on Twitch. So let's talk about the the next thing. Privacy in the cloud scenario: terrorists are plotting to murder innocent people. Some attack, something that they're planning. We don't need to get into specifics. Bad stuff. Something we can all agree is bad. The murder. The Ending of lives, ending of innocent lives. We can all agree that's bad. If you disagree with that, you know, just leave. You know, it's, we all agree that's bad. They're storing their plans and they're showing their plans in, in a Google Drive folder. They have all their docs, images, you know, all kinds of stuff so they can easily share it among the group. If we knew those plans, we could prevent the attack. Should Google access the contents of that drive? If you're good at interrogations and say, so assuming without the, I should add to that, without the contents of the drive, there's no way of knowing that this plot is happening. So you, we don't know that the terrorists, I should have, I should have been more clear about that. We don't know that the terrorists are plotting this attack. Nobody knows, but if we had, if somebody was reading the contents of this Google drive, then I've, then they would know that this attack was happening and they would be able to prevent it. Yeah, so there's no... I mean, I guess I wanted to start there and then lead into it, but let we're, we're taking up a bit of time, so let's just go right into that one. There's no evidence that, this, that these terrorists are doing anything wrong without the contents of the Google Drive. I would argue that Google is already accessing the drive. So is it ethical? If you do think Google is accessing everyone's Google Drive contents, they do claim that they're not. It's in their privacy notices and everything. But if you do believe that they are accessing the drive, is that unethical? I would hope I would hope the answer would be yes, that's unethical, given that they're contradicting their own terms of service. Lives are a lot more important than privacy. If anybody stores their information in a corporate cloud, they're ex they should be accepting that their data will be discoverable. You'd have to know they're plotting something. If we don't know the attack is happening, so there's no reason to get the warrant. So let me word this another way. Should they be able to read 
the contents of everybody's Google Drive just in the off chance that they are planning a terrorist plot. So do you want them accessing your Google Drive just to make sure you're not a terrorist? Because how do they know that these plans are in a Google Drive or not? No. So you're okay with terrorism. Uh, I'm not going to do the gotcha thing. But this this is the trade-off. Do we want more privacy? Or do we want to be able to catch everybody doing anything? Do we want to catch this hypothetical, obviously, situation? Or maybe it, it's less... Uh, less horrible, maybe it's less horrifying in somebody's sharing insider trader information on a Google Drive and we'd like to stop them. Uh, you know, any wrongdoing that's done on a Google Drive, are you willing to sacrifice your privacy to be able to stop these people? Should Apple put that back door in their phone so the government can spy on everybody with an iPhone? That's what we're talking about. Yeah, somebody writes a fictional story, boom, police on your door. Yeah, exactly. What about the thinking of Monday's activity? What if you have something that looks suspicious, looks kind of like a terrorist plot, and Google's perfect algorithm, which has never made a mistake ever, police at your door. You know... Yeah, I think it's yeah, it's good due diligence to not put anything embarrassing. Anything you put in a cloud, you know, if you're under the assumption that everybody can see that, you know, obviously you're going to get some good protection. But what what about people who don't want to take it that far? People who do want to take advantage of the cloud and third, you know, corporate servers and stuff. People who do want to take advantage of that. Like for example, your DMs on your favorite social media site. What if everybody could see your DMs? Like, what would be the point of even using DMs? If that's your stance, what's the point of ever sending a DM? Or maybe you don't. Maybe you don't send DMs. But what's the point of ever sending a DM if you're assuming everybody can see everything you've ever done? If you assume you have no privacy, do you ever send a DM? What if, what if everybody could see those? Because you could be DMing about a terrorist plot. Should should the company have access, whoever's running that site, have access to all those DMs? Well, actually, they probably do in that case. Should they analyze them all just to make sure there's no wrongdoing? And do you want people being called, oh, you sent this unsavory DM? I'm going to call the authorities on you. Do you want Google doing that? Do you want Snapchat doing that? Do you want Twitter doing that? With DMs specifically in those cases. With DMs specifically, do you want them doing that? <laughs> if I'm reading terrible English stuff. Oh, thanks, Toltwish. Yeah, and there and there would always be humans double checking, but do you want you know who are we trusting to do that double checking? You you got a human at that point. I agree. You can't have an automated system flagging terrorists, just like we talked about Monday. Hopefully, very few of you said yes. This should be an automated system, and the automated system should put, be putting people on do not fly list. Hopefully, you know maybe some of you did, um, but hopefully you leaned against that because there are huge problems with that. So we, we would want a human reviewing this, but do you want a human, by nature, a human in your business and reading all your crappy English papers? Do you want that human reading that? Uh, obviously, if it's just, you know, silly stuff. But when it is more private information, do you want them in your biz? Humans are imperfect, and once they have your business, you know, it's not like they're just going to forget about what they read. What if that person ha is this noble whistleblower and posts on Twitter screenshots of your private business because they were hired to review it for terrorist activity and they post it's not terrorist activity and you're fine, but they didn't like what you wrote 
and they blast it on Twitter and dox you and say, this is what this person's doing. You know, we'd be open up that opportunity. Humans are flawed. Somebody could do that. Yeah, for public stories, that, oh, that makes sense to to have manual people manually review public stuff. Yeah, all, all day that should happen. It's not a backdoor; it's the server. For what? Is that how they got uh, Takashi? They were looking at his private DMs. Or was the person he sent the DMs... I, I didn't follow the, the full details of that story. Or was it the person on the other side of the DMs made it public? Was it actually... Was it actually the company? The uh, I forget what even social media service it was. But were they actually taking the DMs? Yeah, Toadfish, this is a yeah, this is a different kind of lecture today, Toadfish. In the upper level classes we do have more discussion lectures. It's more open ended in general, but not too many, I guess, but but this one definitely is. Through an anonymous source. Yeah, when you see a news story, anonymous sources say, Well, was that an algorithm? It could have been. The information was encrypted on their server with the user's password. The company wouldn't be able to access it. Um, not necessarily. Pardon, not in 2020. Not necessarily. Com five. Um, but I don't know how much I want to get into the security. So if if it's encrypted on their servers. At some point, it has to be decrypted for legitimate uses. If the user comes along, submits their password, and wants to read that information, uh, it has to be decrypted, and you can monitor those bits flying around and read that information. So you don't need to crack the user's password or crack encryption or anything. You just have the server sit there and wait for the legitimate user to access their information. And as soon as they access it and submit their password and the the server decrypts all their information and sends it to them. You just read that, read it during that process. You put a, you, know, you add a few lines of code that says once this user connects, you know, copy everything you send to them and give it to me. Uh, so you don't really, it doesn't super protect them. There's no good way to protect yourself. There's no good way to protect your privacy from the people who own the servers that you're storing your data on. There's really no, no solid way to do that. Uh, I mean, there, there are potential ways, but, um, but if you are, like, there's not a good way to do it and still get any advantage to using the cloud. Uh, so you can encrypt and then send to the cloud, but at that point, the cloud's just a storage device. Well, I guess that is what Google Drive is anyway, for the most part. So, so if the encryption key is based on your password, that'd be tough to do too. I'm sure that exists though. It was a federal case. I think the FBI got warrants. For what one? I might have missed what case you're talking about. Oh, for Takashi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they had a warrant for his DMs and then ordered the release. So there was suspicion to begin with. So it wasn't just out of the blue, at least. It's still, that's still a gray area for sure. They had a warrant, went to the, the site and said, hey, we have a warrant. You have to give up the DMs. Should companies do that? Should they comply? Is another ethical question. If there's a warrant, you know, should they be violating your privacy, even if it's against their terms of service? Does the terms of service say, unless the government has a warrant, 
should we talk about the ethics of the government? No, let's not go there. Uh, I don't want to have that conversation because that one doesn't go anywhere useful. All right, let's go to the next one. Data-driven decisions. So this is a Google search. Oh, does that does that show up better on the stream? But the it's a Google search for programmer, and you might notice that the vast majority of them are male. So we have uh, it's no surprise that we have more males. This is a male-dominated field, and the data that we have when we have this algorithm that's fed all the data, well, it's going to show males in this Google search because you know, unfortunately, that's just the reality of it. So what happens when we have an algorithm or any machine learning or AI or something that's trained on a certain type of data, which might not give us the exact results that we want? We would like for people to know that programmers can be girls too. Uh, so what happens when we're training with data and then in reality we see different data? So what if... What if we're training a an algorithm that can like teach programming or or do something related to programming and the algorithm says, well, I was trained on male data because that's what I have, so I'm gonna tailor everything to males, for example. So one that can hit close to home to Buffalo, self-driving cars, they're mostly trained in California, that's where the tech is being developed. What's gonna happen when these self-driving cars see snow for the first time? They're going to have to do some testing, but the vast majority of their training data is not going to contain snow. So they're basically going to have to start over once they, they start being exposed to snow and completely retrain these algorithms. And what if Google just says, nah, do we just not get self-driving cars during the snow? Is that just not a thing we're going to get because Google's in California and they're the ones pushing this technology? Uh, do we just lose out? No self-driving cars in Buffalo. Uh, yes, let let women get a chance. Yes, please. And and I don't want to dwell on that part. I, I feel like we talk about that a, a decent amount. We do in 199 in, in various parts, and you hear a lot out there. Uh, I hope none of us disagree. Like, if a woman wants to get into computer science, is anybody saying no? If you are, you know, get out of the class. Like, just leave and let me know so I can fail you. Uh, women should be very welcome in this industry. But you hear that a lot, and I hope we don't disagree. So I don't know how much of an ethical issue it is. It is an ethical issue in the aspect that you need to be thinking about that. If you're training an AI with some data, you have to be aware of what that source data is. What are you feeding this thing? Because it's only going to know what you feed it. And if you're not feeding it data that's representative representative of the population, you can have these unattended consequences. So in that case, we definitely need to have that discussion. But if you're saying women don't belong in computer science, just get out. Just leave. Uh, so uh, to that end of training, these algorithms are trained on the data you give it. What if we're training voice recognition? I have a, an Amazon Echo in my house, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people can't afford this technology yet. And Amazon, the, the Echo, the Google Home, the way, these, uh, the way these devices get better is each time you use it, it's using that as more training data. So there are Echoes everywhere. People are using them, and the people who are using them are tr effectively training the algorithm by submitting their voices. So the people who buy these, the early adopters of these technologies, and the people who can afford these technologies, and the people who are, you know, welcoming these devices in their homes, and uh, those are the ones who are getting their voices even more recognized by these services. So what about people who can't afford the device, or what about people who don't have a, a good enough internet connection to even support a device like this? What happens when voice recognition gets to this point where it's really, really good, but only for a subset of the population, and then the technology evolves to the point where it's basically a necessity. It's basically a necessity, but there's a certain portion of the population, the world population, who can't use these devices because it doesn't recognize, maybe it doesn't recognize their accent. 
or it doesn't recognize their specific way of talking. What do we do then when we're like, yo, hey, your voice recognition is just part of life now. Sorry that it doesn't recognize your voice. You know, you should have bought an echo sooner. Like we can't, we can't do that. So what's going to happen when we get to that point with voice recognition technology? And uh, just more of a side note, not necessarily part of computer science and software engineering, but research subjects, when you have research studies, most of the subjects are undergraduate students. Like we have a ton of research studies that tell us how like Harvard undergrads behave because that's where a lot of the, you know, a lot of these research papers come out of the big universities. You've probably all seen the call for research subjects where, uh, uh, the, you know, the population that's handy is undergrad students. So you put out flyers and say, hey, any undergrad students want to participate in my study? They all participate in the study, you know, and you'll be happy getting a chance at a $5 gift card. You're still going to go take your time. It's a lot more expensive to get a representative population. So we have a lot of studies that say this is how undergrads at top universities behave, but it's not representative of the population. So a lot of research out there is very tainted by this, at least in my opinion. I, I know I said I wasn't going to give my opinions out there, but at least keep that in mind. Most research is by uh, the subjects are undergrad students. So the research reflects how y'all think for the most part but not how the general population thinks. <laughs> Can't have an unbalanced ratio of male to female friends and CS if you have no friends. Ah, you <laughs> solving the world's problems. Thanks to the real master. Yes, beefy Indian kid. Girls are good at math. You don't... We don't... I don't want to go down into that because we shouldn't be disagreeing about things like that. Women are, are great at computer science too. There's just a lot of, there's more barriers for them to get in. Um, most, the most evident one being they show up to CC 115 on day one, they look around and it's a bunch of boys. Like that's, that's a big hurdle to cross. Think about it if it were the opposite way. If you're a male, you walk into CC 115 day one, you look around and it's mostly girls. It's going to affect the way. It's going to affect you in a way. You know, how it affects each person will be different, but it, it's, it, you'll notice. Like my first day, well, let's not get into it. My, I'll, I'll very briefly, since I started it. My first day of 115, so I, I went to college, I dropped out, I took some time off, and then I came back. My first day of 115, I said, oh my goodness, look at how young everybody is. And I felt so out of place. I felt like the an old guy because I was like 22 or something. <laughs> I felt super old. Um, when you're not, when you don't blend into the population, it's, uh, it, it, it's a real thing. Yeah, exactly, Frosty Dude. I don't want to keep going down there because... Um, for one, you probably heard it a lot of times, and two, we shouldn't be disagreeing on that. There's, I don't think it's an ethical dilemma because we're not going to disagree. There's no debate to be had. If somebody says women shouldn't be allowed in computer science, to get out. I've already said it though. Uh, delete timeout ban. Yeah, every time talking to me is a slippery slope. I feel like every year I have less of a filter. I'll say whatever's on my mind. Time to buy followers. A phishing attempt during an ethics lecture. Again, that's probably not ethics because we all agree it's wrong. But uh... <laughs> Yeah, there, there's that side too. <laughs> Spelling out our dreams. I mean... Yeah, no one better disagree. Keep it moving. And I think that I think this is more of a comment. I mean, you're hitting on it here, but uh, I, I I think I think a like a fifty fifty ratio would benefit everybody. 
for different reasons and varying to varying degrees, but uh you know. Okay, let's get let's get to the next one. So the the point is if you're training an algorithm with data, which is how AI works, you give it feed it data and then the algorithm comes out the other end and no one knows what happens in the middle. Always being aware of the data that it's being fed. If it's being fed bad data, uh, there was the story, hey, uh, it was linked, it's one of the reading articles of the Microsoft chatbot that um, that people realized they could feed it a whole bunch of garbage and then it just started saying the most horrible things imaginable. Uh, it, AI is only as good as the data that's fed when you have database things. All right, so speaking of AI, well, we're we're at the end here, but I wanted to, I thought we'd get to this one a lot sooner, actually, but we had good discussion there. Um, should we keep going with AI research? Simple prompt. Should we keep going? And what happens as we approach the singularity, which is the point where AI becomes more powerful than a human brain? What happens when we have a general AI that's smarter than a human? And I shouldn't say smarter, but more capable than a human brain and the AI starts to outpace humans. So once we have an AI that's smarter than a human, I said smarter again, but you know what I mean? You know where I'm going with that. And that AI can build the next AI better than any human can. And then it just starts snowballing, getting out of control where AI is just its own thing. This is a real concern. This is a real thing that can happen. In my opinion, I think it will happen, and it's just a matter of time. And experts in the field, the, their estimates vary, but even the most conservative estimates say by the year 2100, AI is going to reach this point where AI is more capable than the human brain. So should we just shut it all off and say, no, AI research is illegal? Yeah, if we if we do shut it off, you're right. China gets there first, and we're all screwed. China's doing um, gene splicing research that we can't really do in the United States. Like they're getting ahead of us in the the shady sciences, if I can call it that, because they don't they don't give a crap from what it seems. Um, between that and intellectual property theft, they have no concept. Uh, the government, I, I'm saying. The government has no concept of intellectual property. They just let a let intellectual property theft go rampant. Um, yeah, the, that's one of the counterpoints to any regulations. Like, if we don't, they will. Somebody will, at least. Yeah, humans need not apply. That's a good article. I should have linked that. If I... Singularity is limited by hardware. But once we get a, an AI that's smart enough to design new design and manufacture new hardware. I mean, once an AI is, is like with modern current hardware, if we I think if we built a big enough supercomputer, we'd probably get there pretty soon. And then that supercomputer figures out how to create smaller more efficient hardware that's more capable than itself like it it, it can get out of control so the, and the problem is we it's going to be hard to know once we've hit that line and once we cross that line it's over like the ai going to do what it's going to do and what if and, and this is in pop culture is uh we have Ultron, we we develop Ultron. It's designed for world peace and to protect us. It analyzes the data and says, oh, wait, humans are the problem. We just need to get rid of humans, and then there will be no conflict. Which, you know, apt analysis, by the way. Um, but I don't like the conclusion very much. Beefy Indian kid. Damn it. 
think about what you're doing. So that that's a good uh, good flashback to what I was saying earlier. Beefy Indian Kid, please at least think about what you're doing. And for, for what's worth, I will share my opinion here. Yeah, I think we should keep going forward uh, with technology. And, but we need to think about what we're doing and tread cautiously. Because uh, honestly, I don't think there's any stopping the singularity. I think that will happen eventually. We can we can try to slow it down and stuff, but there's always going to be people who, you know, as, as technology keeps furthering, it's going to get easier and easier to develop the singularity. Even if you make it illegal, there could be a group of grad students in a lab somewhere who just goes rogue and develops it, you know. I think it's an, an, an inevitable. So the best thing we can do is say, let's do it. But let's have a worldwide discussion about it and make sure we're doing it as responsibly as we can. And then hopefully it goes okay. Because we don't want somebody doing this who's just mind bent on destruction. Out of spite or something silly like that. Yeah, hard. The hardware and software, like both advances in either, is going to get us closer to that. Like, if hardware gets more advanced, our software can still can be as dumb as it is now. But I think either of them could get us over the line without the other. What does it do if we poke it with a stick? Yeah. I could see that. And that's a reasonable timeline, I think. 2045. If you think that's unreasonable in 25 years, um, think about, or maybe more than think, maybe research or something, what the world looked like 25 years ago. Yeah, you wouldn't really be able to think about that one, most of you. Um, but what the world looked like 25 years ago. There was no internet. There was no obviously no smartphone because there was no internet. Uh, there was internet, but it was really, really in its infancy. It, it didn't really exist. It wasn't common for everybody to have an internet connection. You might be able to go to a library or a school and get an internet connection. Uh, AOL was just starting out. And then 25 years before that, where, where are we? 95, so um, 70, 1970s, computers were barely a thing. Uh, most people didn't have, I guess nobody had a home computer at that point. Computers were the size of a wall. Um, if we keep going back, electricity isn't even that old. Uh, the taming of electricity, that was only you know a couple hundred years ago. About a hundred years ago that the light bulb came into existence, much less the LED that we're used to these days. Um, being able to look at a monitor like this, that's a pretty new thing. So how far we've come in a pretty short amount of time, you know, what's the world going to look like in 25 years? We already see AI creeping up in our lives. The algorithms, those are all AI. It's all at least machine learning. Yep, AI that's probably smart as most animals. It depends what you mean by smart. I was trying to avoid using that word earlier and I kept slipping, but... Depends what you mean by that. Because um, animals are... Like, we still don't even understand how brains work. So, there's... In some ways, yeah, AI is smarter than animals. But in some ways, they're not... Like, the, the amount of pattern recognition that a brain... Not even a human brain, but in, even an animal brain can do. We can't quite match an AI yet. But I think that's the biggest thing. I think that's most of what a brain even does, is pattern recognition. So once an AI can start recognizing patterns more efficiently, I think all the other forms of, you know, what we'll perceive as intelligence is going to just follow right away. It's not okay to kill a dog. I agree with you so far <laughs> about an AI as smart as a dog. You ever see that video where, where they have like the pack mule robot and they kick it and you feel bad for the thing? I know it's just a robot. I know it has no feelings, but I feel bad for the thing. Would it... You know... 
would it be okay to kill an, a, uh, an AI, an artificial robot, you know, a robot, or not artificial robot, but an, a robot with artificial intelligence that can perceive and things. Uh, for those, for old uh, Next Generation fans, Star Trek, would it be okay to just murder, or I shouldn't say murder, but uh, deactivate Data? They had a whole episode on that. Is it okay to just deactivate him? Uh, somebody came aboard the Enterprise and said, no, we, we need to deactivate him permanently and study all his circuitry to see how this works. Like, you're not killing Data. Like, you can't do that. And the guy was just like, he's just a machine. He's just a tool. It's not a big deal. Just, you know, true. But once they're at a point where we start growing attached to them. And if you don't, if you're on, if you say yes, it is okay to just deactivate them. What happens when they they have you know somebody gives them um, artificial emotions, emotion centers, and things like that? You deactivate one of their friends, and now they're pissed off at you, and now you have an AI army that wants to kill mankind, uh, humankind. I think just for our own survival, we shouldn't be deactivating them. But then when do they die? Do they live forever? Are they immortal? Yeah, what is life without death? Oh man, we've gotten to the existential crisis point of the conversation. Which means it might be time to go. Uh... AI is ethics accepting. Does it take ethics of a nihilist and decide? Yeah. If AI is super just rational thinking, they might nuke the planet. Maybe somebody has the best of intentions and says, I want to make an AI that's going to solve global warming. And they say very accurately and aptly, just like the, the, uh, uh, Ultron example very aptly see that global warming it it's humans who are releasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere kill all humans solves the problem the AI did what it was programmed to do you can't blame the AI there What if it is self-aware and capable of abstract, independent thought? Does it deserve rights, then? Yeah, should they be able to vote? These are good questions. Questions that... I encourage you to think about, especially if you're going into an AI field or even machine learning or anything related to this. These are things you need to think about because if you're going to be one of the ones pushing us closer to this edge and you haven't even put any thought into this, you're going to be a problem. A lot of problems would be solved if humans were destroyed. Don't tell the AI that, though. Try to get the AI to avoid that conclusion. Please. Anyone who's going to be working in that field. <laughs> if kill humans, don't fix them. Yeah. See, Quantum 5, I need you on the team. Whoever, Whatever team is going to be getting us to the singularity you need to be on it even if your whole job is once once your teammates are like we've done it all we have to do is turn this on you're just like whoa whoa whoa, whoa. i just need to add one line of code real quick okay now go that can be your only job if that's your only job you've earned your salary and they should pay you a 
million dollars a year. Yeah, what's happening from replicating a billion times and voting? And is that what we want? Should AI decide? AI can probably make better decisions than we can. I mean, how do most people make their voting decisions? Probably very irrationally. If an AI can, in a few seconds, analyze all of the data, all of the positions of all the candidates, and decide which one is going to most benefit the world, I mean, should they be doing that? Should we have an AI that just decides world leaders? How are we going to place faith in that AI? You know, who monitors the algorithm? An AI would need to place infinite value on human life for it to coexist with us on the planet. Probably. So, we're, we're going to get deeper into the philosophy of this. I'll push us over that edge. Is there any case where a human should be killed? And I'll, I'll push it all the way to the, the Hitler example. Is it okay to kill Hitler at the height of the Holocaust? Would it be okay to kill that dude? So do we leave, if and if the answer is yes, sometimes in very rare situations, there are cases where somebody's just got to go because they're too much of a hazard to everybody else. Do we only allow humans to make those decisions and not allow AIs to make those, AI to make those decisions? And self-defense too, yeah, that's, uh, and we could, I think that one is an easier answer for in the AI context of, just don't let AI defend themselves. If somebody comes up to it and wants to, you know, destroy an AI, let's let them do that instead of programming the AI to be able to defend itself with lethal force. I think that one, that one's a bit scary. But are there, if we allow that, but are there cases where we should let the AI go out, you know, maybe it's programmed for world peace and it says, yo, this terrorist leader's got to go. If we're ever going to reach, achieve world peace, do we let the AI make that decision? Or maybe humans have to verify it. Maybe that decision must be left up to, to humans. The greater good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, will it? If we, yeah, if we code it, infinite value for human lives non uh, a finite value for its own life and it's it, will it be tempted to become advanced enough to disobey that and say no my existence once it becomes self-aware who scary stuff once it, if it becomes self-aware and says no my life is more valuable than my code telling me to do this thing is it going is that inviting it to dis obey that line of code and learn how to rewrite its own programming do hey for that matter do we even train ai to write code it's one of the conversations i like to have is automation should we keep automating things and what impact will that have on the economy people are going out of jobs etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh i'll always twist it on y'all and say well what happens when the ai starts writing code and your jobs are gone because the AI just maintains its own code and you've got, got to go figure out something else to do with your life career-wise. Because the AI, usually the answer is like, well, somebody has to maintain the AI, somebody has to maintain the machines and stuff. Well, what happens when the AI can maintain itself in its own code? And should we allow that to happen? Because once it can write its own code, ooh, man, scary. Oh, yeah, we'll just become the AI. I like that beefy Indian kid. Yeah, there we go. I do think we'll we'll start seeing more technologies where we have tech implanted into our bodies once we can figure out how to integrate it with biology. I do think that's one of the next that is like you say the next logical step of evolution. But yeah, what if we never have an independent AI? What if it's always just integrated? We'll be more like the Borg. Maybe that's our future is to become the Borg instead of just pure machine. So instead of the Matrix, we'll go to, to Star Trek. If 
AI was biological and not mechanical, how does that change the moral argument? Oh, yeah. I, so I, I think at that point, we would just have to treat them as humans. If, well, assuming that you have, a, you start with a human and, and inject the AI parts and make it a cyborg. If that's where we're headed, then you got to treat it as a human. But if we have a machine and we inject cells into it, that could get a bit, ooh, oof, oof, oof. And I got to cook dinner soon, so we're not going, I'm not going all the way down that path with you. I'm not ready for an existential crisis today. I've gone down these conversations before, and it they can be mind-boggling, which is the po- which is the point I want you to think about this stuff. If we get all the way to mind-boggled, then you've clearly thought about it. Infinity can be represented with a flowing point number. Yeah, we have double dot infinity. <laughs> it's true, and double dot negative infinity. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the real master. He has some good ones today, man. Uh, the first challenge for AI would be understanding what the client wants. Once we get AI to that point, we can get some benefit. AI, write my user stories for me. I can't understand what this client is saying. They're talking in circles. They contradict themselves. What are they actually asking for? Once they can do that, we'll probably be at the singularity. <laughs> replace AI with academic integrity and reread this conversation. <laughs> I'm sure it changed the context. Um, yeah, beefy Indian kid, but, but what happens when that tool becomes more powerful than you? That's the scary part. That's what we're talking about here. Yeah, it is the next tool. I think we're still going to make it. We're still going to use it. I don't think there's any stopping that. What happens when the tool becomes more powerful than you you could even argue that the internet itself well i don't know if i want to make that argument but the internet itself might already be more powerful than any at least any one human especially since it's a collective human mind the internet for those of you, you know those of you who are star trek fans i'll try to lower the references but um but the internet is kind of like the collective the borg how we're all sharing our thoughts and i don't know the the analogy the the comparisons are kind of creepy we're even getting to the point where we have group think on the internet where you have to think a certain way just like the borg you can't have an independent thought uh, go, going out i'm not saying it's to that degree right now but that is where the internet's headed you you have to conform Resistance is futile. Detroit become human? I haven't seen that. I haven't played that. Would be oh I, I said I'd keep live chat, so sorry, I gotta skip some there. Humans can probably read themselves better than I can read that sentence. Oh <laughs> a different sentence. Lana, read our inner thoughts, darkest secrets. Is it is it ironic that I'm having trouble reading either of those sentences and parsing them? The internet can't make me a sandwich, though. I mean, there's Grubhub. You can just order a sandwich. I, there has to be... So the internet, as a collection of human beings, can certainly make you a sandwich. I can order a sandwich and have it delivered to my door using the internet. Yeah, it can bring it to your front door, which implies somebody made that who was using the internet, who was part of the collective. No, yeah, I, I wasn't trying to make the, the connection. I wasn't trying to say the internet. That was a separate thought. I wasn't saying the internet is an AI that's capable of that, but the internet is a, a collection of human minds working together and has kind of become its own thing. Uh, kind of like the Borg, where the Borg is a collection. For those of you who haven't seen it, I'll give a little background. It's a collection of uh, of biological beings that have all been assimilated, and they get a lot of cyborg parts added to them, and they're all part of this one collective where they're all wired in together, 
and they have to follow the orders of whatever comes down the circuitry of whoever's controlling it, which happens um, to be one of the, you know, one of the big Borg people, you know, get, there's a lot more to it, but, but that's what I was making the connection. The internet is kind of like that, where we're all connected and acting as one collective entity. I wasn't referring to the internet as being AI. So that was a separate conversation. Yeah, you already have to kind of think a certain way. Yeah, it's happening. It's happening more, and, and maybe a lot of you are too young to see this, but there there has been, like, that wasn't true 20, 30 years ago. Uh, there were lots of different opinions. You could think lots of different things. But now things have conformed to, you know, there's a certain set of uh of societal norms these days that that wasn't always the case but now that we have so much connection and so much interaction between other humans that we're kind of converging on this is the set of beliefs that that everybody should agree with and if you don't you're, you're canceled and and that's a pretty new thing that came along with the internet and keeps evolving keeps getting to higher and higher degrees so what happens when that collective group think gets to its ultimate end and there's here are all the things you have to agree with or else you're basically kicked off of the collective you don't get to use this at all and you're trying to live life without the internet without that connection to the rest of humanity you know in it, its in it, its completely like if you take where we've where we've come from where we are and just project that out to the future to its natural conclusion i think that's kind of scary there's at least some ethical considerations to have should we have that uh, is there one right answer to everything you know I'll, I'll let you I'll let you finish that and draw your own conclusions but uh is that a good thing or or should we have conflicting opinions because really there shouldn't be any conflicting opinions about anything there's going to be one objective right answer and AI would be able to find that once it becomes powerful enough. It'll find all the right answers and tell us what we should be thinking. What we lose is our humanity. And uh, I think that's where it gets scary. It gets into... Uh, I don't know how we how we went down this road, but it gets into to fate. Like, if there's one way that you have to think in every given situation and some AI is going to tell you, you know, this is how you have to think. Do you have any agency over your own life anymore? But you didn't think you, we'd talk about that today. Hell, I didn't think I'd say that today. Um, yeah, maybe that's what's going to save us, duct tape. That the internet enjoys conflict so much that we won't converge. Because be pretty boring once all our humanity is stripped away and we all agree on everything what's there left to do <laughs> you know obviously there are tons of things to do but as human beings i don't think that's specific to the internet i think human beings like conflict and that might be what saves us our our love for conflict Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a Black Mirror episode with that technology too. We're just completely blocks. Oh, scary. Yeah, you can think things ironically. And you can always say, like I said earlier in the this lecture, uh, I'll play devil's advocate, and then you have a free pass to say whatever you want. <laughs> so there's still loopholes, at least as of right now. Uh, yeah, and now it's a thing. So I won't say it's a thing right now, but it's we can see it in its infancy right now. It's been growing over the past 20 years. Ever since the invention of the upvote button 
and we could see what most people agreed with or what most people like yeah that would that would, episode was creepy i mean all episodes of black mirror are pretty creepy but if you get blocked by someone and you just can't communicate with them at all oh my goodness and they just show up as this blurry blob How can I call myself a human if I don't troll on Twitter? Alright, I gotta end this. Actually, I have to go cook dinner. I gotta make some burgers. But I, uh... I'm gonna click this. It may not be appropriate, but I'll check that out at a later date. Yeah, why even bother being... And that's what I mean. If it takes away our humanity and our free agency, I mean, is it even worth it? If AI will just tell us, hey, you're part of this collective and here's what you have to do because we're all working towards a common goal and this is how you play your role towards this common goal. Like, I don't know. Hey, I, I just wanted to... I just wanted to go have fun today and re and relax. Well, that doesn't help us, so you can't do that. You can't go to a concert. You can't go hang out with your friends. You can't play video games. The AI is going to tell you no. Entertainment. I can't. Yeah, that's true. I have to go make some burger sandwiches. Yeah, Synchroism, we've talked about that a bit. I mentioned that. So once the AI gets smart enough to make the next AI, and and especially if an AI can make an AI that's more intelligent than it, which is fundamentally what we're talking about, because if humans, if a human can make an AI that's smarter than a human, we have to accept that that AI would be able to be the most capable entity to be able to make the next smarter AI, which would then make the next smarter AI, and then it just blows up and gets out of control, and humans are no longer the dominant species on the planet, if you consider AI species or whatever, the most common, the most dominant thing, group, collective, whatever, whatever we want to call it. Once AI is better than us, and that's what we call the singularity, yep. It's the system from the Hang the DJ episode, Black Mirror. I should rewatch some Black Mirror. Yeah, I will. Yeah, AI will make itself obsolete too, but you you know, I don't care. <laughs> That's the problem. It once humans are obsolete. Like, I don't give a crap what replaced us and if it's going to survive and replace itself with something else or, or what. I, you know, humans are not on top anymore after that. I don't care if that first generation of AI abs you know, makes itself obsolete. We're no longer going to be on top anymore. That's the issue. I don't care who's on top. I just care that it's humans. If it's not humans, I don't care who it is, what it is. It's not human. That's bad. For me, for us, you know. I shouldn't say bad, but it can be very bad. Once we lose control, I mean, there's plenty of arguments that humans shouldn't be in control. So if we can replace us with something better that'll do more good, yeah, you know... I'm not thrilled about it, but once humans lose control, mm. yeah, AI hey, might just say we should turn us turn ourselves off. 
you know, in the singularity might be a good thing. It might be more like Wally, where we just get to kind of hang out and do nothing all the time, do whatever we want, and the AI takes care of everything. Maybe that's the future, and it's more bright uh, than the way we're we're talking about it here. But in any case, we won't be in control anymore. We'll just be another animal on the planet. We won't be on top anymore. Anyway, with that thought, I do gotta go. So, with that thought, humans might not be in control of this planet at some point in the future. Let's go enjoy the rest of our days. Yeah, the real master, that's a good one to end it on. We're just a pile of sensors in a vast universe trying to find our way through it for a little bit at least. Thanks for spending a little bit of it here today. I like to end on that note. That's a good one. All right, take care, everybody. Have a great day. I'll see everyone Friday. I added it to the schedule. It is an activity. I already posted the activity. So if you want to, uh, it's an individual activity. If you want to get it ahead, ahead of time, go for it. All right, take care, everybody.